We want to welcome all of you, and we especially want to welcome Sister's whole family that has come tonight, especially her two sisters, Miriam and Cecilia, also Raymond and Rosalie Zogby, Mary Jo Zogby, Teresa Ackleskamp, and Mark and Miriam Ackles Clairhout, Larry Ackles Jr., George Francis Ackles, Mary Emma Ackles Karam. Cecilia Ackles Martin, and I hope I didn't miss anybody. We're all so happy that you could be here with us. Let us pray. We gather this evening to remember Sister Frances Dogby. We know we have to return to you, O oh God, the lives of those whom we love. While we are together, we love as we can. We share as we can. We influence each other often without being aware of when or how. And then we have to let go. We believe, O oh God, that you welcome Francis into your life and love. Amen. Let us be seated as we listen to the bi biography of Sister, written by Sister Eleanor Craig, our archivist. Frances Gertrude Zogby 
was the eldest child of George Khalil and Emma Kaleli Zogby. Her father was born in Beirut, which was Syria at the time and now Lebanon. Her mother was a native of Mobile, Alabama, where the Zogbys raised eight children in Immaculate Conception Cathedral Parish. Of Francis's siblings in this close-knit family, three are living, as well as three of their spouses, and I note also nieces, nephews, and assorted others. Miriam, Cecilia, and Raymond have been Francis's faithful companions since her, especially in her final years, visiting her at Loretto Mother House and arranging wonderful traditional meals for the whole community to celebrate Francis's birthdays and anniversaries. Frances began her association with the Sisters of Loretto at Immaculate Conception Grade School and then at Bishop Tulin High School. Her high school memory book is in her personnel file. It, she lists her personality assets as a good disposition and a generous nature. Comments by fellow students and teachers at the time say the same thing. Frances graduated from high school in 1940, and although she expressed the desire to join Loretto at that time, her family preferred that she wait, and in the meantime, enter the family business. For more than five years, Frances was the owner and manager of Zogby's Grocery Store in Pritchard, Alabama. In 1945, Frances again pursued her religious vocation, talking with some of the sisters in Mobile about her desire to join Loretto. A year later, leaving letters for her mother and father, Frances slipped away to the novitiate. A small card in her file in Reverend Mother Edwarda's handwriting says, this telegram was received by Francis, who left home two days ago. The telegram is from her parents. Dear Francis, letters received, miss you much. Take good care of yourself. Don't worry about us. Write often. Glad you are happy. God bless. Letter follows. Love, mother and daddy. Francis was received into the novitiate August the 15th, 1946, taking the name Sister George Francis, by which she was known until the late 1960s. She made her first vows August the 15th, 1948, and her final vows three years later. From the novitiate, Francis was sent to Illinois to teach grade school at Highland Park. She was there seven years, then spent another seven years teaching at Highwood, Sterling, and finally Rockford. She went briefly to Loretto Academy Santa Fe and Holy Family Denver. All the while, Frances worked on her undergraduate degree in the summer times, first at Barrett College in Chicago, then at Loretto Heights, Denver. She completed her bachelor's degree at the Heights in 1966 with a major in education. In 1966, Frances returned to her home state to teach, first at Our Lady Queen of Mercy in Montgomery, then in 1969 at Christ the King, Daphne, Alabama. In Daphne, she formed a working partnership and a close friendship with Sister Pat Butenbach, who was then superior and principal of the school. Together, they brought Loretto's work in Daphne to a close in 1972, and together moved to Denver, Colorado, where they worked at St. John Parish School. 
In 1977, the two began a 20-year collaboration as managers and consultants for the World Book Childcraft Collections. They earned two paid trips to Hawaii and one to Spain. They also made several trips to the company headquarters in Chicago and to conventions in Dallas. Francis and Pat faithfully served many schools in the Denver region, including our own St. Mary's Academy, where they were well known, especially to the librarian. Pat Butenbach moved to Loretto Mother House Infirmary in 1998, and Francis followed in the year 2000. For three years here at Loretto, these fast friends included family and sisters in their warm and welcoming friendship. Just before Pat died in 2003, Francis and her two sisters were at her bedside. Francis celebrated her 90th birthday last year with gusto, surrounded by her Loretto and her Zogby families. Her final difficult months were much eased by the nearly constant companionship of Miriam and Cecilia. Francis died quietly late Wednesday evening, October the 29th, in the 68th year of her life as a sister of Loretto. Some years ago, Francis wrote, I would prefer to be buried at our beloved Loretto with the solemnity and beautiful music which our sisters usually provide. It is our pleasure to satisfy this last desire of Sister Frances Zogby, a truly generous woman. Francis asked that we pray the glorious mysteries of the rosary at her wake. We will pray the first decade, the resurrection. Our Father, you art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Amen. 
Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. O oh my Jesus, forgive us our sin, save us from the fires of hell, and lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need of thy mercy. This reading is an excerpt from the Sermon of Meinster Eckhart, a 14th century mystic from Germany. In it, he speaks of God's longing to enter into the human heart. When the human spirit is ready, God enters it without hesitation or waiting. It is written in the book of Revelation that God told the people, I stand at the door and knock and wait. If you let me in, I will sup with you. You need not look either here or there. God is no farther than the door of the heart. God stands there, lingering, waiting for us to be ready and open the door to receive the one who is waiting. You need not call God and as if he, God were far away, for God waits more urgently than for you for the door to be opened. You are a thousand times more necessary to God than God is to you. The opening of the door and God's entry are simultaneous. Word of God, child of the earth, to which Francis now returns. In baptism, you called her to eternal life, to praise God forever. Have mercy on us. Chosen of God, you clothed Francis in religious life and you clothe her now with the glory of your kingdom. Have mercy on us. Jesus, Crucified one, you protect Francis by the power of your cross, and on the day of your coming, you show mercy to all the faithful departed. Have mercy on us. Jesus, firstborn of the living and dead, at your voice the tombs will open and all the just who sleep in your peace will rise and sing the glory of God. Have mercy on us. All praise to you, Jesus our Savior. Death is in your hands and all the living depend on you alone. Have mercy on us. 
And now if you'll give us a few minutes, we'll prepare so that people can share. Anyone like to start? I'm sure you have many memories. I did prepare some remarks, but I, I hope you will enjoy them. It was a dark and stormy night. A hurricane had struck the Gulf Coast and was rapidly advancing inland. The narrow two-lane highway disappeared in voluminous sheets of rain that were driven like bullets into the windshield of the large station wagon, whose 12 passengers were stunned, silent, and saying the rosary. The calm voice of a female passenger in the back seat led the prayers. She did not fail or falter. She was soft yet strong, comforting yet unyielding, fervent yet cool. Over and over, she spoke the tried and true prayers of her faith, the time-worn phrases of her childhood, the universal talisman of Catholicism. She never stopped. The driver, Straining in the pitch black darkness to see the road was losing control of the vehicle. The heavily packed luggage rack on top contributed to the imbalance of the car and it went into a massive skid. The driver later recounted that St. Michael the Archangel had appeared to him as the car careened back and forth across the highway. The Archangel was indicating with his spear that the driver apply the brake. The driver hit the brake hard and the car fishtailed, did a 180 degree turn and came to a full and complete stop in the center of the road. The car was intact and all of its passengers were dazed, but safe. I was a passenger in that car, along with my parents and eight of my siblings. The year was 1969 and I was headed to Spring Hill College in Mobile, the hurricane was Camille, and I was never so happy to be with my Aunt Anna as I was on that memorable night as she courageously led us to the rosary. I truly believe it was her physical presence, her spiritual essence, and her direct prayer line to our Heavenly Father that saved our family on that treacherous night. If not for her, we would not be here today. Reverend clergy, beloved sisters of Loretto, family and friends, my name is Larry Ackles from Dallas, and I'm the oldest nephew of Sister George Frances Zogby. We called her Aunt Tana, and she was always unique and special to us because she was a nun. Although we were taught by the nuns in Catholic school, it was different to have an aunt who was a nun. Back in the 50s when I was just a little boy, I remember going to Mobile to visit, and sometimes Aunt Tana would be visiting as well. In those days, I never saw her without her all-black habit with starched white collar and full accoutrements. She was not even allowed to spend the night with her family. I remember riding in the car with her back to the local convent where she was staying. Aunt Tana seemed happy to be a nun, and her family admired and respected her choice of the religious life, but apparently that was not always the case. It says that it is only in death that a person's life is revealed. So now the story can be told, as it was recounted to my sister, Mary Emma, 
by Aunt Tana a few years ago right here at the mother house. After graduating from high school, Tana told her parents of her desire to be a nun, but they were initially opposed to the idea, especially her father, George Zogby, who immigrated to the United States from his native Lebanon at the turn of the last century. He expected her to go into the family retail business and even open a store for her, which she owned and operated for five years. But God had other plans for Tana. She persisted in her desire to enter the convent in spite of her father's opposition because she knew that God was calling her. She turned to her own aunt, Sister Dolores Zogby of the Daughters of Charity, for advice. Sister Dolores recounted that her parents, too, had opposed her going to the convent and that she had secretly traveled to the convent without her parents' permission. So Tana began to plan her own elopement, and with the help of Sister Dolores and the other nuns, she secretly caught the train to Kentucky. With the passage of time, her parents saw how happy she was, and they acquiesced in her decision and rejoiced that their daughter was a nun. As for Aunt Tana, she told Mary Emma that she never regretted that decision a day in her life and was happy to be a sister of Loretto for 68 years. Gertrude Frances Zogby was born 92 years ago in Mobile, Alabama to George Khalil Zogby and Emma Cahaley Zogby. She was the oldest of their eight children. She is preceded in death by her parents and by her sister, Isabel Zogby Ackles, my mother, and her brothers, Khalil and Michael, and her brother-in-law, Lawrence, my father. She is survived by her loving sisters, Miriam and Cecilia, by her devoted brother, Raymond, and by her faithful sisters-in-law, Josette, Mary Jo, and Rosalie, all of Mobile, and by dozens of adoring nieces, nephews, and their offspring. While Tana's life as a bride of Christ began here at the mother house those many years ago, it could also be said that, my, that the life of my family began right here as well. For my parents spent part of their honeymoon here in 1949. Although it was probably my mother's idea to visit Tana at the convent on her honeymoon, my dad was a pretty good sport and went along with it. He always enjoyed telling the story for years and years about how he spent his honeymoon at the convent. My parents returned to Dallas and within a year they were born at St. Paul Hospital, staffed by the Daughters of Charity. Guess who was there to assist in the birth? It was none other than the aforementioned co-conspirator, Sister Dolores Zogby. God really does have a sense of humor. Aunt Tana's life as a nun took her to Illinois, New Mexico, Colorado, Alabama, and finally back to the mother house. At each stop, she conducted herself as a model nun and a living example of Christian faith in action. She weathered the storms of liturgical change and cultural upheaval in the 60s and remained true to her vows. When the order stopped wearing the habit in the 70s, she never wavered in her faithful devotion to the precepts of her sisterhood. There is a saying that a nun is a woman who exists to show that God exists too. God called Sister Francis to be his witness on earth, and she never faltered in living the Christian life. Some of her happiest years were spent in Denver with her dear friend, Sister Patricia Budenbach. Tana and Pat were award-winning sellers of World Book Encyclopedias, which gave them an avenue to continue teaching by word and example. They sold so many that they won trips to Hawaii and Spain. Sister Frances came back to Kentucky to spend her last years. There was no place she would rather be. Indeed, it had been an eventful journey for this courageous young girl who followed God's call in the face of adversity. In her final days and weeks, her loyal, faithful, and loving sisters, Miriam and Cecilia, came from Mobile to be with her. They were like angels on earth as they attended to her to their big sister in the hour of maximum devotion. 
and they were with her as she took her final breath on this earth. Sister Frances was blessed by God with a long, productive, and wonderful life and a beautiful death. She fought the good fight. She completed the race. She kept the faith. Indeed, she was faithful unto death. She not only endured, she prevailed. Together, we rise up and call her blessed, and the angels welcome her to paradise. I'm 62 years old, pretty soon. Have a birthday in November. I'm usually pretty loud. One of my first memories was being told that I was part of the Triangle of the Three Georges. George K. Zogby, Sister Francis' father, Sister George Francis, and I'm George Francis Ackles. I was named after her. Yeah, I remember, uh, Two things about Antana. She was definitely an educator, and she was definitely a disciplinarian. And I think because she was a nun, you know, struggling at the age of six to figure out where that fit going to St. Phillips uh, in Texas, my first grade teacher was Sister Annette, and I liked Sister Annette. She was always nice to me. And that's where I felt the connection with Sister George Francis as an educator. I got older, and then in eighth grade, I had Sister Angelina. And that's when I felt the disciplinarian part of what Sister George Francis was all about. She wore some of the most extravagant uh, habits that I've ever seen. In fact, some of the ones she wore, and they changed, I guess, a little bit as time went by. Some of the ones she wore, I felt that there was a strong enough wind, it might actually lift her off the ground because they were... Some of the ones, I guess, they even portrayed in The Flying Nun. But and like Larry said, I think once those kind of went to the wayside in 1970, things were different. Um, and I kind of miss those days. But um, her sales of World Book Encyclopedias was also something that touched my family. We bought a set. Uh, several of us did, but, you know, so we probably helped pay for part of those trips. But... Uh, we had a set of encyclopedias and they took a prominent place in my house. You know, I had a desk that was built in with shelves all the way up to the ceiling and I put them on the top shelf because I felt they needed to be shown off. The first time Aunt Tana came to visit, she wasn't there five minutes and she grabbed me and pulled me aside. Those books don't belong up there. They belong on a lower shelf so the children can get them when they want and learn when they want and not have to go to somebody else to get them. So again, she kept that, that was kind of a combination of education and disciplinary, and I think I was in my 40s then. <laughs> the last thing I remember, and this is something I remembered my entire life, uh, she taught me to look at things from a different perspective, that the way people look at things is normal. You had to force yourself and be strong enough to look at them a different way. She taught me if you took an apple and stood it up, and sliced it down and opened it up, you would see the apple core and the seeds. But if you laid it on its side and you sliced it and you opened it up, you saw a perfect five point star. And that remained. Uh, it's a story I tell often and it tries to make people stretch and look at things a little differently. Thank you all for doing this tonight. <laughs>
I don't know how many other people resisted her charm, but I was one of the people that she tried to talk into selling the world book. <laughs> and I, I said, there is no way, I'm not a salesperson at all. Educate maybe, but not sales. But I want to also, some of you have seen the set of world book encyclopedias in the first floor lounge. And in each book is the return address label from Sister Pat and Sister Frances. And to this day, we have one of our 99-year-olds who goes to those books to look up something. And she made us get them up from the bottom shelf where she couldn't get to them. So we had to get them up where she could get them. <laughs> but she insisted that we put them where she could use them because she goes in nearly every day to look up something. So their memory will be here for as long as those books exist. <laughs> I'm not going to put my back to Francis, excuse me. I was three years old when Francis went to the convent, and she always liked to remind me of that. And she, uh, that was August the 15th, the day before my birthday that she, that she left. But I want to thank all of you. You're, you are her family, and uh, we love each and every one of you. And on behalf of Rosalie and I, and all of our sisters and sister-in-laws, we want to thank you for all you did for Frances. When she was in Denver trying to decide where she wanted to go, of course we wanted her to come to Mobile. But uh, she decided to come back to the mother house. And we see now what a great decision that was. I'd also like to thank my nephews and nieces who have come in from Dallas and a few that can't be there. And I see we still have the camera rolling. My four, our four daughters are watching this right now as we speak, and other members of the family, and other cousins and nephews and nieces. And I think it's just wonderful what you do here. I've been here three times, once at five years old, and then once for the 90th, and then today. And I always I have had a special feeling when I came here. And I love the atmosphere that you have allowed God to create here. It's just beautiful. Thank you. We probably now need to go to different places in the country. Um, they'll tell us from Denver where we're going. Okay. Um, as we have done in the past, uh, we'll offer it up for anybody else who'd like to share out in participants of Zoom. Um, I don't think we have anybody in Denver who would like to share a story, um, but if you actually just raise your hand, um, anyone else, uh, physically in front of your camera, I can see you and I can call on you and we'll give you a mic. So are there any other stories to share? Okay, people are keeping stories in their hearts. Um, just so folks are aware, there has been a change for the for the funeral tomorrow. The broadcast on the funeral will not be on Zoom. It, or excuse me, it will not be on Ustream. It will be on Zoom, like the wake is being broadcast tonight. So if you would like an invitation for the funeral tomorrow, please send me an email. Um, it's rsalee at lorettocommunity.org. 
Um, and we will also be recording the funeral tomorrow, so it will be available as a recorded video. Okay, so Mother House, I'm going to turn it back to you unless there's anybody else. Okay, Mother House, it's back to you. Do any of the relatives out there in cyberspace, do you have anything you'd like to share? I'm not seeing anybody uh, requesting time, so. I'm Cecilia. I'm Sister Frances' youngest sister. And I can't tell you how very much she touched my life. I can remember everything from the day she left home to the day she went to heaven. She was a wonderful sister. They tell Miriam and I that we are wonderful, but we learned it from her. Anytime any one of us got sick, my parents or my sisters and brothers, she always came and took care of us. We felt that she was our rock. She made everything right. And when she entered the convent, shortly after then, my dad and mother came and Raymond, he was just a little baby. Uh, I remember, they, I thought they said two years old. As the historian, I just have to throw that in. And she, that was one of the hardest things, was for her to leave Raymond, the little baby that we all love so dearly. And then shortly after then, my father and my older brother Khalil, they brought us here to Loretto with my brother Michael and my sister Miriam and I. And in those days, I think the ruling was that you got to stay three days. Well, we got in sort of late in the afternoon, and so my father said, we'll go to Lebanon, and we'll spend the night there so we can get up early in the morning and come to Loretto and have a full day. And we did, and it was quite an experience. We stayed at the sea, I'll never forget. And on the way, we stopped in Nashville and stayed at the Knoll Hotel. And my father made it all so convenient and so comfortable for all of us. And we got up early the next morning and came to Loretto. And it was just wonderful seeing all the sisters. And sister was a postulant then, if I remember correctly. And um, it was just great. And Mother and Water asked my father, one of the sisters had to go into Louisville to a dental appointment. And she asked Papa, would he take her to Louisville? And my father, of course, said right away, yes. And uh, she was so gracious that when they got back, she told Papa, that they could stay another day since they had lost that time taking the nun. You know, I remember all of those things. I don't know how, because I was very young myself then. And it was, I guess I must have been eight or nine years old. But everything, I could remember everything about the grounds and every place that we went. And I am so impressed with the museum now that records all of the historic things that the Loretta nuns have done. We were all taught by Sisters of Loretto at Bishop Tulin High School and in grade school, the Sisters of Charity. And of course, my aunt, Sister Dolores, wanted Sister to be a Sister of Charity, but she wanted to be a Loretta, the American order, so she could come home sometime. They couldn't come home back then. I don't want to go over, but the paper that you read about Sister, 
uh, your archivist in St. Louis interviewed me. And she was amazed that I could remember so many things at such a young age. And she compared them to what was in sister's file. And she said she could confirm it all. So, but that was the impression sister made on me. She was my life, she was my protector, she was my guardian. And she set a beautiful example for all of us. And if we follow her example, we'll meet again someday. God bless all of you and thank you all for your hospitality to us. Thank you.